Yo, yo. What up? What up? Yo. What up? What up? Hey. Hey, welcome. Welcome to Benny's Crib. What up? Oh, uh, yeah, just leave your shoes over there. It's cool. Yeah, thanks. Does that sound cool? Yo. Yo, what up? Welcome to Benny's Crib. Beautiful people, we are here at the crib live. Well, recording live. You're probably catching up with us a couple weeks down the line here. But regardless, excitement levels are high. We have another interview. A DJ, an artist, a producer, a former WMPG radio host, Gabe FM. How are you? Good. Yeah. Tremendous. <laughs> Thanks for having me. All all the interviews starting banter. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> we got to get the uh, proper introductions underway. We're going to uh, dive into some deep discussions, I think, of many different topics involving music, but I tend to start just in the beginning kind of of your existence in a sense here. And this is the first question we ask everybody. What's the first memory you have of hip hop? I came in prepared for this. Tremendous. <laughs> uh, it was um, purchasing the Uchi Kuchi cassette single, MC Brains. I don't even know if I've heard of that. You should. What you year should. is this? Do you know? Uh, Time period loosely? I think 89, 90, somewhere in there. What? That's That's the first like memory. I'm sure there was things before but that's like you know uchi was which uchi coochie was it called uchi coochie by mc brains mc where are they from oh i don't even remember i it was a long time ago i i do have it on 12 inch but i you know it's been a while hey well we'll get back to the uchi coochie (laughs) maybe later um gabe fm where were you born I was born in Portland, Maine. Dope. (laughs) Did you grow up in one place primarily? Um, Yeah, I I grew up in Wyndham until I was about six or seven. Then the folks split. My dad moved in uh, to the exchange building in Portland. And then, like, my mom eventually moved to Portland, so. Nice. So you were, I mean, you've been in Portland then since, like, what, before you were 10 years old then? Oh, oh yeah. Nice. Yeah. And um, I think you mentioned before the podcast, before we started filming, but you graduated from Portland as well, right? Yeah. So most of your youth, if not your whole life, then has been kind of rocking out here. Yeah. Tremendous. Well, that's a good establishment, I guess, just the background. But let's get into the music stuff now, because I think that really seems to be a common bridge between a lot of parts of your life. Was music in your family or your household growing up? Uh, my dad played guitar a fair amount, and, like, music was always on, especially, like, I was even going to daycare in Portland, so it was, like, music in the morning in the car ride, you know, like... Do you remember, like, specific genres that were pretty prevalent? Uh, I remember, like, uh, there was a Beatles rubber soul tape that got played a lot. And, um, what was it? WMGX, I think. The radio station. Yeah, so, like, a lot of, like, 60s, 70s, that type of music. My parents were, like, kind of hippies. Yeah, I was going to say stuff from, like, your parents' eras, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Oh, man. I was trying to think of another question I had that involved maybe, like, origins of Gabe FM. Oh, yes. Being... In the radio world, being in the music world, for the longest time, I assumed, and this is why you shouldn't assume, that FM was only pertaining to that. But is it also your initials? (laughs) Yeah, it's it's my last two initials. So it's kind of, even like in high school, there were a bunch of Gabes, and everybody had their like last names as, you know, their tagline for who you're talking to. But... My last name, like people couldn't like mess with the whole last name or remember it, so it was just Gabe FM from like 
I don't know, like eighth grade, freshman year, I think. Damn. Yeah. It's almost like the name or the the destiny kind of chooses itself in a sense at times. Yeah. Because it sounds like, in, again, in my research, I found this, I guess, so I could be incorrect, but you've been DJing for a while. Did, did you start DJing in 1994? Around that time, yeah. Like, I was, I started buying records, like, eighth grade, like, freshman year, and was, like, kind of putting together a DJ setup, but it was a little different than nowadays where you just go out and, like, buy, like, turntables that are, like, for DJing. So it was, like, a Radio Shack mixer that was just, like, four channels and, like, record players. <laughs> yeah, so stuff. what time period? This is, like, the early 90s? Or yeah, like, like 90... What time period in your life, I mean? Like, is this in high school, you're saying, when you're getting into this? Yeah. So it's early school. 90s, so the the gear for, as you're saying, DJing is much different. Like, you're going to have to literally just be needle dropping and pretty much picking everything up yourself, correct? Yeah. I think around, like, 15, 16, I got, like, a pair of Vestax um, turntables that were, like, direct drive. I think I, like, had a snowboard that I either traded or, like, sold to get the to money. Upgrade they weren't, your, your they weren't new. They were, like... That and like the, what was it? It was like the Scratch mixer. I'm Gemini Scratch. That was the mixer, which was like what everybody got, you know. It sounds like it's essentially made for record scratching. So yeah. Oh, the cat podcast people. If you remember last time, young the cat knocked a fucking cactus on me. So I have since moved the cactus from the shelf. I put a little toy car up there to test because I don't trust this motherfucker and I don't want another cactus to hit me. So if you hear a toy, Hot Wheel, or Matchbox-esque car in the background, that's why. Shout out the cat, though. Shout out animals. <laughs> Was DJing your foray or your initial foray, if that's the correct word, into a more personal relationship with music or were you listening to music a lot previously to that that kind of I mean, kickstarted that I was listening to music a lot I was uh like back then um there was this club Zoots in Portland we t- I've talked about Zoots actually a couple <laughs> podcasts ago on the Alter G podcast I think I talked about this and it was they were saying it's kind of like a, a more younger oriented place right well I mean it it definitely went through like different phases but like mm. At that point, it was, there was an All Ages Friday night there, and it was, um... Chem free. Chem free. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, like, decades Respect. of dance, so it was, like, 70s through, like, 90s music until it was, like, 10, I think, or 11, and then Larry Love who's out in L.A. now, um, would uh, play house music. And so, yeah, I mean, we would go there. There was a coffee shop next door called the Elvis Room. Where where was Zoots? It was um, Forest Ave, like right by Congress Street. Where like Empire kind of is now? Like behind it, there's like... The bowling alley place. (laughs) No, no, so it's... um, they're like restaurants there now. I think there's like a Thai restaurant there or some shit now. Yeah. And like, uh, I don't know, it's across from like that parking lot. Not the like the tall one, but like the, the flat. The flat one. I think yeah. there's like a bowling alley underneath that allegedly yeah. or something. Yo, get me underneath the city. What <laughs> fucking paperwork do I got to fill out? What liability? This is oh. like episode 117. I keep talking about this. I, I got someone that can get you under the city. For real? Like, allegedly. Not, not with, allegedly. Allegedly. This didn't happen. Yeah, but I, we can discuss. After. Nothing. This is AI. Any <laughs> shit you see that's alleged is a deep fake. Okay? Yeah. Allegedly. <laughs> it sounds like Gabe FM. To get back to your story here, is someone who at a young age just enjoyed going out, hearing music, consuming music, buying tapes, so much so to where in high school you want to start DJing yourself. Yeah. I don't want to say it in my own words, though. Like, talk on this time for yourself. Like, uh, what kind of kickstarted all this for you wanting to just start getting those turntables and mixing? I don't know. I, I like, 
think just going out, there was, like, kind of DJ culture going on. I mean, it was more on, like, videos and stuff like that. Like, videotapes. Mm, actual and, VHS tapes. Yeah, and, like, MTV and stuff like that. But it was... I don't know. I I also, like... Uh, enjoy, like, going to raves and, like, those type of parties at that point, too. Yeah. So, I mean, that's... It's all about DJs. But it was a little more, at that time, more about people dancing. Like, it wasn't a giant room full of people staring at a DJ. Yeah. It's like a DJ curating the music and everybody's enjoying it, but they're all doing it in their own way. Is the cat touching you? Yeah. We're we're chilling. (laughs) Watch out. She might bite you. She gets kind of fucking playful. (laughs) Yo, podcast people. I've never seen Young do this. Young the cat literally jumped onto the sofa and is strong arming a guest. Intimidation tactics. (laughs) I'm actually nervous. I feel like I might be... In young spot. The uh, young be goofing, man. That's so funny, bro. I gotta get my podcast situation here. Yeah, I want to get into the whole DJ culture nowadays type of thing. Cause we'll say that yeah. towards, t- towards the end. Cause I, I hundred percent agree. I think the content creation phase has fucked up a lot of people who want to be DJs. And not to say you shouldn't maybe be on a stage. Not to say like you shouldn't even like have a camera for your sets. But the point of DJing to me is never to be focusing on what's going on in exclusively the booth. It's about the floor, the people, the dancing, the connection that you have with each other. And I don't know, like, I feel like people who want to just play become DJs to be celebrities end up looking like Grimes half the time. So that's kind of my two cents. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's, you know, like it's, it's all been a, a part of everything, you know, it's like, it's just things kind of shifted a little bit more from like dance floors to like performance art. You I think know? that's a really good way to explain that i'm trying to like talk nicely yeah no during I'm... this because uh you know i mean you're someone recorded. who's been a very <laughs> uh you know connected to dj culture from a from a while so i mean whether it sounds like you were buying tapes and maybe you wanted to just even do some type of i don't really want to call it like hip-hop dj but you know maybe doing some kind of two turntable mixing like that but also going to situations like raves where dj can also kind of be a different situation where it's like a hip-hop dj you know cutting breaks is a little bit different than you know a house dj at a rave yeah i mean there were like some djs doing crazy things so like locally uh, or just like that you were paying just like at raves i went to and whatever let's talk about these fucking raves shout out some of these wild (laughs) rave memories yo (laughs) i mean i i caught the end of like some of the Chris Clark parties in Portland and like we don't know who that is. You got you got to break it down. Chris Clark was that like he's like the DJ back then? No, or? no, he's like the person that like he brought a lot of you know I love to like music in the area. Like he he put on raves and where um, where would they be? Um, warehouses. Like, in, uh, in town? Yeah, and then also, like, later on, there were, like, raves that went on where it was, like, so that Club Zoots, there are, like, three buildings in a row, and so they would actually have all three buildings, and the front doors would be shut, and it was, like, three different rooms, so you would go outside and back into each like place. Oh shit. So it you know, and it's like they will be packed. Um also I don't know, I don't remember going to I think it was deep, which was at a spot called the Bahama Beach Club, which is like In in Portland? Down four staff. Dude, this is well like there's nothing like this anymore. It was like here, a huge club that had like black light carpet and all sorts of stuff and i mean i don't know it was it was a good time like to be in portland like as a teenager just because like people like all t 
teenagers would be hanging out in Portland. Like from all over Maine would just like come to Portland to hang out. Like you would go downtown and there would be like 50, 75 kids just like wandering around, skating the median on Middle Street. Well, like, like weekdays or just weekends? or I mean weekends and like sometimes like after school I mean, or i'm like even the, thinking like summer must have been pretty wild summer too, was i'm crazy. from old orchard's the same year you know old orchard's a very big youth place um in the york county area because it's like the beach yeah. town and shit so I, I mean just you you could pull out your neighborhood and you could go five minute walk and you could bump into three dozen people your age i feel like yeah i mean this was like probably around my freshman year my freshman year they put in post office park and we would be out in post office park, like, you know, allegedly drinking. Allegedly. <laughs> Where is post office park now? It's right across from uh, Tommy's Park, the one with the rocks. Got you, got you, got you, got you. Yeah. Um, so, like, there would be, like, a huge group of kids hanging out. We'd be hanging out on Exchange Street, like, sitting on all the stoops, like, just sitting like hanging out all the time you know mm. like mm. there were always people like skating downtown there was always like i don't know it's weird for me to like be older and be like where are all the kids like no, i uh, feel well, like this is like a feeling a lot of artists maybe who grew up who were a teen younger or on these time periods like you it's you know almost like foreign to think about portland this way i'm like wait there was like all these like youth clubs that like youngins could go to and you could just chill all day and like have places you could just pretty much hang without getting kicked out of or like you just mob because you can still do that as a kid there's skate parks and shit too but like it's just it's very touristy out here and it's very uh you know well, that's i mean cops started kicking us off the stoops and like trying to get people for like loitering and stuff like that and they put like a curfew on the park and stuff like that so it was like there was a effort by the city to shut down all these safe places for like people to hang out you know like third spaces almost yeah like you're hanging out you're not at home but you're still out with a group of people and you're all like together and it's like, you know, uh, the city of Portland wasn't so chill with it. Yeah, well, I feel you, man. It's, it's important to, like, hear about what it's like back then, you know, whether it's just, like, the actual kind of, like, everyday culture out, like, in the parks and streets or even the venues and DJs and stuff like that because things do change a lot. And if we don't talk to people who were there, we don't get to, you know, remember what they were like firsthand. And uh, it just is evident that you're someone who just seems to enjoy their local community and has an interest in being a part of it in terms of a a musical sense you had a radio show on wmpg called hip-hop division i believe yes and it began in 1999 ish and ran through 2004 ish yeah so yeah um i'm gonna like pull it back and then we'll yeah 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 yeah. just so we don't skip over to um but so basically after high school, I moved to Providence, Rhode Island, Rhode Island, Dumb and Dumber, Fifth Street. Did and you did you live in Providence when Dumb and Dumber came out? I don't. Dumb know. and Dumber came out like 94, I think. No, no. OK. I don't know why I know that. I was there like 98, 99. So they were in Aspen by then. Yeah. <laughs> and so I uh, at that point, I was all about like jungle. And that's like the the UK genre. Yeah. Um, now some people refer to it as drum and bass. Drum and bass, yes. <laughs> but uh, I moved into a house of all like jungleist DJs and like a jungle MC, and then like I kind of was like, well, they're all doing this, so I'm just gonna move more towards hip hop, <laughs> and then like. At that point, like, Boston scene was pretty big. Yeah. And Let me like, pause you before we go to Boston. How did, why did you pick Providence? Uh, so I, uh, I graduated high school, and I went to, like, go on my, like, you know, all-American road trip. <laughs> and I made it. I went to Bread and Puppet 
in Vermont, which was okay. like a like a big like kind of festival, like kind of political type thing, but also like a party atmosphere. Um, and then I went to Providence, and I lost my debit card. <laughs> and you did you did you and stay so, there? <laughs> and so I had to stay there because this was like when you had to like have it shipped to your house and like them like yeah, this is late 90s right yeah oh, yeah so you could just call like go on the internet and get your it didn't, america it didn't shit. show up you know and i didn't have that much cash and i'm like staying at my friend's parents house with my friend in providence and uh like we were like just hanging out and i'm waiting for my bank card so i can like continue my road trip and his friends are like, well, do you want to, like, move in? We just had someone move out, you know, like, and I'm like, uh, stay on the road for, like, a month, maybe more, or, like, stay somewhere else indefinitely. And I was like, uh, fuck it, right? It's a good thing you lost your card, I guess. Yeah, so I was there, and, like, that was, was pretty crazy times and uh yeah, yeah. so i paused for, you for a year <laughs> you're there for a year yeah jumping in a kind of dj culture dj lifestyle sounds like i mean you know jungle is a pretty popping genre i feel like at that time in the western world especially so it must have been a pretty i don't know exciting time to just be here. well it was it was fun but like i ended up switching over to like hip-hop because i was around all these junglists was it like was right like, from the jump or was it like kind of a decision it, you made before you went to boston oh no i wasn't even in boston it was just like being like when you're in providence boston's like 45 minutes away so it's, it's true, like yeah, kind of like metro area type situation and like at that time like all the like boston underground rap just was like blowing up you know it was like you had mr Liff, uh acrobatic seven l and esoteric you know um at og <laughs> i mean at og was far before that yeah but, that's true is he but, what is this late 90s yeah, because he, yeah. he's been rapping. Or, no, he's, like, early 90s. Yeah, well, I'm thinking, like, this time period especially for you. But, is like... Yeah, and then also Providence had a pretty big hip-hop scene. Like, Sage Francis was there. Um, oh, I forget. Nonprofits, he's... which he was a part of. Um, time Machine was coming up, I think. And so, like, there were all these, like, big shows that were, like, at the living room there in Providence that were, like... Shows where it's like virtuoso, acrobatic, Mr. Whiff, 7 L and Esoteric, Jedi Minds, Lewis Logic, Sage, all these people, like in one show. Oh, yeah, it was like Army of the Pharaohs time period. Like, yeah, so it's like giant hip hop shows and like stuff like that. So it was a good time to be like buying records and like you know, kind of repping, like, the area that you're living in. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it's cool that, like, you, you know, were in Providence initially kind of more maybe attached to the jungle kind of side of things, and then, you know, you see, all right, well, maybe I should kind of do something else that yeah these people ain't doing, and then it's perfect timing because that scene, I mean, Boston's always had a scene, but I feel like especially, like, in the early 2000s, late 90s, it started to really, I don't yeah. know, just explode more. Yeah, and so I was only in Providence for a year, and then I moved back to Maine, and that's when I started, like, the radio show. Hip-hop division. Yes. Why'd you move back? What made you want to come back to Maine back then? I mean, it it was like, uh, well, self-care, we'll say. Yeah. You yeah. know? Just, like, just balancing things back balancing out. Balancing <laughs> things back out. Sometimes things get hectic, and you gotta get cat. back to it, you know? What's this cat doing? So, yeah. But then, like, so I I was uh, living across the campus from the radio station. USM. Yeah. Perfect segue, because I wanted to talk about Hip Hop Division. I wanted to talk about your show. Uh, I will try to withhold bias, because I do a show currently at WMPG. 
and I'm like the hip hop director, uh, which is like a funny title because I don't really do too too much, but I guess I kind of just try and connect a lot of dots. Regardless, I'd say that because it's a very digital vibe now. I mean, we have two computers there. You can use, you know, the internet to play and stream songs and even listen live. But I'm wondering, like, 1999, obviously there's computers and internet and shit, but what was the station like? Like, was it more, especially the gear, is it more like CD-focused, tape-focused, so turntable-focused? I mean, there were, like, mini-discs for a lot of your like drops and that's commercials little tiny kind of square things you put it's in, right? like a cd that's like encapsulated in plastic it's the really really small cds right yeah they're yeah. like i don't know inch and a half two inches but it's almost like half the size of like a floppy disk yeah so there were those um and like there were record players and tape players and cd players uh and i think a couple dat machines maybe what's that uh, that's a tape. Gotcha. Like it's kind of like a eight millimeter tape. It's if like you're a, familiar, like, like, like a like small like A-track? like a small VHS, like it opens up in the front type okay. of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if I remember right, it's been a minute. Since it's a lot of a lot of random gear from back that. then, man. Um, but uh, when I was there, uh, the there were a couple other hip-hop shows but the station manager wasn't really feeling hip-hop or anything associated with hip-hop so it was um not the most welcoming of uh like scenarios like we got along but it wasn't like well, how'd you even get the show in the first place um i think I, you used to be able to just do training, but I also knew uh, Jessica Lockhart. Like, Shout out Jess, yo. Yeah. yeah. Uh, friend of my parents. And so, like, I think I might have, like, heard about it through them and took the training and then, and you, you know. You said you weren't even a student, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> I was Same. not I, a student. I, 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 no. I was, like, graduated college and had been out of that shit for a while when I did my training, too. I thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> But, I mean, I had listened to MPG forever, like, the first CD that I got, like, because back in the day, like, when you get, like, a boombox, it would have a CD player in it and stuff. Or, like, if you got one with a CD, you got, like, um, a sampler CD yeah. with it. And then, you know, CDs were expensive, but I won a CD at... Uh, through WMPG. It was a Scene London show. Nice. And it was uh, Ice Cube the Predator. Oh, that's a, I love that album, yeah. Yeah. Scott, it was, uh, it was a good days on that. Yeah. Check yourselves on that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so going back to when I was at the radio station, um, and I think Scene was actually still there when I started my show. Um, but me and my friend had, like, we started doing, like, a, a website called mainhiphop.com. Wait, not a Braden... Uh, Braden Big? Biddings, yeah. Biddings, yeah, yeah. I didn't um, know you were part of Main Hip. That's, like, one of the first yeah. URLs in Main Hip Hop kind of digital history. Yeah, that was me and him. Was he part of the radio show as well? He had a radio show... Like, we both had late night radio shows. I think he had a Saturday and I had a Sunday. Weekly? Yeah. And you could play curses then, right? If it's late night. Yeah, late night. Yeah. That's why, like, I took a. Yeah, my late show's show. from 10 to 11.30 every Monday. And I'm just like, hit the cursing right off the bat. Because it's like, it's really not. It's not necessarily, like, difficult to find hip hop that is radio friendly from the, uh, what is it, 6 to 10 o'clock hours. But. It's just so much easier when you don't have to worry about that shit. Yeah. It's just like beyond night and day. Yeah. What was the vibe like at the station? Like uh, in terms of, I don't know, just like, I don't really know how to articulate the question because I, I want to talk about main hip hop and you and Brayden, but oh, yeah, yeah. one thing I think about when I think about radio from late 90s to early 2000s is the connection that 
a lot of like labels often had. Like you could just get promo CDs mailed to radio stations all the time. Oh, I don't know if the BMPG was big enough. Was there that... were records coming in all the time. Um, CDs. I mean, you like just for free. You're saying right? Like you just stations. said something to a label and they would ship you, like uh, CDs. I also like. Yeah, I mean, I went to like Scribble Jam a couple of times uh in ohio and like um before the uh station while i was at while i had the radio show and i could just basically say to anybody i'm like yeah i have a radio show like it would be like here take take this take did that you, did you give you like a and like a single or like what the radio editor and everything n- not always radio edits because i was more like going for underground type stuff oh, hey yeah, because you but, said you had the late night yeah and a lot of times, too, I get full albums, and I was really trying to, like, even stuff I didn't like, I was like, you know what, it gets one play, you know? Like, I'm going to play it, because even if I don't like it, someone else might like it, you mm. know? like It's just wild to think about the uh, cataloging of music, because... I mean, the internet was in in the studio, right? You had computers there. Right? Yeah, Obviously. there was the internet. Like, but it was di- was it dial up? No, it wasn't dial up or anything. Like, um, there was like a pretty good internet connection. I think because it was associated with the university. That's true. But even like you know, ninety nine is. You, I mean, my cousins had like the AOL discs, and we were going you know online, and it was quick enough. But like, I still feel like. There is such an importance of physical media back then. If you've never been yeah. to WMPG, there are rooms just filled with CDs. There's a basement filled with CDs. And a lot of them, like, say, like, promo. A lot of them are just, like Gabe's saying, they're sent free from labels and studios. And, you know, I'm not going to get into a whole diatribe on why I don't really like major label studios and labels and, like, the toxicity of the greed of the music industry. But in this time period, specifically the 90s, there was so much bread and resources in these industries. You'd get so much free shit if you were a DJ. And now motherfuckers just be like, doop, doop, doop. Like, you can go on Spotify and you're like, who cares? But it was not easy to get music as easy yeah. as it is now. And it's just like, being someone who collects physical media, I have such a respect for people who just were in the trenches in like the height of the physical media days and putting in work, like acquiring even something as silly as a single. Like... I imagine on your trips, were you coming back sometimes with more music than you had when you went out there, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're probably I mean, just picking up so much shit. Yeah, and also I was buying a lot of records, like... And that's heavy, you gotta bring that shit. <laughs> at, at that point in time, I think I was spending, it was like, every two weeks when I got my paycheck, it, I gave myself a budget of 100 bucks for like, 12-inch singles, so I'm like, just going to Bull Moose and, like, Newberry Comics and flipping through and being, like, even picking out, like, some random stuff and just being like, ah, that looks like it might be good or, like, you know. Um, Not being able to, you know, pull something out of your phone and be like, let me Google this producer or let me Google this label oh, and yeah, see if no, I know anybody. You couldn't do that. But, I mean, also there was a lot less stuff out there, too. You know, like, it was... There were certain networks of people where you could get things, but like there was just the amount of music that was actually accessible for people to get out and like get to people was a much smaller amount because you had to actually, if you were able to like even make music, you know, like it took effort to make music you had to get like a four track or an eight track or like have a computer that was like powerful enough to record on or you know and like that stuff jumped really quick but you know like having the knowledge to actually do all that there was definitely like a curve now it's like people like you know everything you can just look up how to do something and it wasn't that easy and then it's like you know for making beats you you know everybody was getting different gear and it was kind of like based on like what they 
had it like accessible to them and what like also um they could afford you know like um because like npcs were expensive you yeah know? Just, i mean even just talking about like computers like you need to have a pretty either like you're dropping bread on hardware that can handle it or like the software itself could be hundreds of bucks just to get to make yeah. things back then and finding like cracked software was like a little harder allegedly Oh, yeah, and you could <laughs> fuck up the family computer. Your computer is so much easier doing that. Yeah. Like back in the day. Do you remember anything wild from Scribble Jam? Like, what's, like, some good memories from that? Uh, I mean, I was... I don't know if you've ever seen, like, the Scratch Bastard, um, like, what was it? Emperor's March? I don't think where so. Where he turned, like, uh, Buck 65 Centaur into, a emperor's march like i was there that year which so was, sounds like some iconic dj history and he had to pull that out to like just get to the last round it wasn't even the last round like it was like because it's, it's dj well actually yeah. what it to people at home like that they might not know what is scribble jam uh S- scribble jam was uh i think they're actually making a documentary about it i think like dibs and some other people are making a documentary no shit. on it um but it was uh like a graffiti uh mc battles or battle um dj battle um and like it was just basically like this huge hip-hop festival that was like in Cincinnati, Ohio, and like it went, I think it was like Thursday through Sunday. It was like a meet and greet night where they usually had shows, and then Friday I think they had shows, and then um, there was a daytime thing on Saturday that was like all day, and while you were there, like there were like graffiti writers from around the world doing like like a lot of <laughs> there there was a massive like amount of wall space there so there are people doing like giant pieces and it was all like the biggest crews from around the world and you know like this is like huge place for like underground hip-hop yeah and i mean i think like the year before i went it was like Dose one and Eminem battled, or you yeah, know, like, like, scri- like if you Google Scribble Jam '90s, like there's a lot of like people before they blew up. Like you said, Eminem was like Scribble Jam, for instance, and you know, it's uh, I mean, that's just like a big name. That yeah, <laughs> I can still, be like, oh yeah, you know, cats like us. It's I think you know, we might have more details than the average hip hop consumer, so to speak. But yeah. I think for me, it just is a testament to your passion as a fan. You know, I feel like you're someone who just has a big, uh, just draw to be at live shows, watching DJ sets, doing a DJ set. Um, it just seems like you're a big fan of the culture, for lack of a better phrase. Yeah, I mean, it's it was kind of like... From an early age. Yeah, it was, I mean, hip-hop was pretty much my life at that point, like, because I had the show... And the website and like just just going nonstop, you know. Let's talk more on the website because you said Braden Biddings. Yeah. A lot of people I've interviewed, it's like, oh yeah, well I first started rapping, <laughs> and, like a couple people out here. I remember like mainhiphop.com, they post my stuff. It was like a forum or something kind of like that. Yeah, so it was a message board, like a, what were they, BB message boards? It Actually, was... I don't. I feel kind of weird even having to do this, but. There probably uh, might even be. Can you explain what a message board is to people who might not know? Yeah, so uh, a message board, I guess I would have to say is, oh man, it's hard to describe. It's kind of like a like a Twitter feed or something it's like, like that. OG social media, <clears throat> almost. where like there would be posts, but you could always go back to these posts and read them, and then you could respond and you would like have your own login and 
you know, like people will post about like something or they post like their music and like ask for people. It's like Reddit. Basically. It's very, yeah, it's very, it's, it's, but it's one domain. It's like usually like this domain is for this specific interest. Yeah, so what we did is um, there were different categories in there. So there was like an MC one and a DJ one and a graffiti one. Oh, and cool. people could go in and like, um, and a general one and like, you know, uh, so like you could go in and like, chat and people would post their rhymes up there and people would like critique them or like i mean realistically like everybody knows on on the internet like hate always conquers and like gets the drama going and then like people go back and forth so like there were there were a couple of like people that would just like write stuff up like and just hating on people's stuff and like early trolls yeah and um one of them was like the cynic and he would like just cause all sorts of drama that was the username i think think it was the cynic (laughs) so it's funny man even back in the day this motherfucker's just hiding behind uh what's it called when people have accounts burners yeah what motherfuckers i love I got so much love. I love being a hater on a lot of stuff too. I don't get the burner shit, but whatever. I've I've been like trying to quell my my hate, you know. Well, I think it's like yeah, it's weird. Hater, <laughs> I identify with hate. I don't like. I don't like yeah, hate. Yeah, yeah. Hate is too much of my energy. But haters almost like you know the hypocrisy of language where it's like hater almost feels like it's not as serious. It's kind of just like yeah, like I'm a hater of modern. Like, ooh, look at me, DJ culture, as I was saying. I don't hate that, though. I'm not, like, seething, like, I fucking hate these boiler room sets. It's, <laughs> it's just more like, come on, man. Like, it ain't about you, bro. Like, stop smiling and playing the same simple, like, shit all the time. Like, I guess because when I DJ, I really just want, like, people to, like, I would rather have people have their back to me the whole time. Just be immediately, like, dancing, taking yeah. pics with each other. I don't want fucking people filming the DJ booth type shit. I guess it's just, like, the whole, like, thing of... I don't know, it feels like it's like maybe a social media phenomenon where it's like this thing where every moment has to be like, you gotta have these little possessive moments where it's like, I was here. I saw this dope artist or this dope DJ. And sometimes it's like, are you there? Are you just like documenting it? Because if, if, I'm, if I'm in a place, like my spirit gotta be involved with what's going on. It ain't just like an aesthetic. But yeah. again, that's like, you know, that's me being kind of like a hater. I wouldn't say I have like hate and it's funny yeah, to yeah. think back like there's even my fuckers back in like the og message board days doing shit like that yeah um did you feel though an, an effect of your work on that website out in the community like were you known as the main hiphop.com people um yeah i think Braden was definitely like uh more known for it he was also like the mastermind behind like all the it related things that like encompassed the match message board like he was like able to write in php and stuff like that and so like he set up the domain and like all that stuff yeah, it's like, no more fucking like squarespace era yeah it's not no WordPress, no this was like you you had to like build stuff out in html and like that's just tough bro html is not like an easy and yeah and he knew how to like put google ads on there and stuff like that we paid for the site by clicking google ads a lot allegedly (laughs) like back when you could just sit there and like click from ips and stuff allegedly this is allegedly my homie had a ruinscape account and you could click click you know what ruinscape is no i don't it's kind of like uh it's like a digital what are those games called toys what type of game is it Ruinscape. MMORPG. MMO, massive multiplayer online role playing game. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can, like, kind of like kind of like World of Warcraft, kind of. And you can, like, click and do this thing that he was doing to, like, boost a certain skill level. And he would just be clicking it. We'd be hanging out. I'm like, what are you fucking doing? He's like, I'm just boosting my level. My cousin, I think it was, he legit got a drill, duct tape, like, a little piece of paper to it. And then put on a low speed, and it had enough pressure on the paper where it would spin and click the whole time. 
And he would just literally be like having this drill in the other room for eight hours. And ever since I've seen that, I've been looking for something, just like you said, where I can like make passive income doing something like that. I mean, can, they catch on. That's what I'm saying. You, but you, the AI now, you can't do shit then like that. Then you got to like sign up for a new account. That's so allegedly. F- but back in the day, allegedly, you could just <laughs> click your own ads and right? I mean, it wasn't like making bank, but it paid for the but site. But you could get, yeah, you get the free nine ninety nine. It was for <laughs> for a month, and you yeah. to, it's just that type of hustle, man. That's the energy we need. I love that type of like self sustaining shit. Yeah, like and, I uh, think I I'll, I might have gotten written up at work because I was like going on to computers and like clicking ads. <laughs> <laughs> I Allegedly. love that shit. I, <laughs> that's like the most self. That's like when you plug an extension cord. <laughs> into uh no it's like when you plug a power strip into itself it's yeah. just unlimited power man yeah. when did you get the no request tattoo uh that was that was pretty recently because i think it's right here right yeah it's, it's right. so when people ask to play something you yeah. say no requests i don't know if the camera can see that but was there a specific yeah. memory that made you want to do that no just i just got fed up yeah Plus, I mean, it put bro like it puts bros in their spot. <laughs> like when you're dealing with like some moron asking like for a request for their like partner, and they're like, "Oh, blah blah blah, can I like hear this?" And you're like, eh. and they're like, "Oh, respect, respect," and it's like, yeah, respect, really. <laughs> All right, <laughs> that's that's pretty funny. Yeah. Um. Talk on your love for Bay Area hip hop. I mean, I I love some hyphy. I didn't get too deep into like mob stuff, but uh, yeah, I think like I don't know. Just in general, I I think that traveling around and finding music is really important because there's a lot of local music that you don't find out about like i mean yeah you can like find stuff out on the internet and like things like that but i think that like traveling you can kind of tap into more like local scenes that you may not be privy to well it sounds like, like to your time period it's pre like the internet really globalizing everything so regionalism is almost more like i don't want to say celebrated but you can go to area and be like oh i've never really heard this stuff as much before yeah i mean i moved out to the bay for a few years and like um i was in san francisco and like at that time i had serato it was just with like control vinyl and like so i would like be at my friend's houses and they would have stacks of cds and i'd just be like while we're drinking beers or something i'm like ripping their cds <laughs> like that's like i'd sit there and like oh like putting them into your serata library like yeah i'd bring my laptop wherever i went and, like if i was hanging out with people i was just like that's oh yeah so can smart. i just rip your cds while i'm like here and like just just keep growing your your vault yeah exactly so like you end up getting a bunch of stuff i mean i have like tons of music that i've never even listened to but it was just like you know just more you know when were you in san francisco um i was in the inner sunset for a little bit on like funston street which is 13th they didn't do a 13th street 13th what when um like what time period uh, oh, when? Uh, yeah. yeah, sorry. Um, oh, this is where I, I mentioned to you before that, like, my my uh, dates and times are not always... Well, the, the radio show good, ended but... in, what, 2004? So, was it, had yeah, it was, I'm guessing after that. It was around that time. Gotcha. Um, and I was out there for about three years. And then I end up moving to, like, the D.C. area. I moved to, like, D.C. and then, like... Northern Virginia, Alexandria, for a few years, too, after that. What made you come back to Maine? Uh, It was actually my dad passed away. And so I was like, I wasn't really feeling like the D.C. area. Like, just, I mean, I have, like, 
my wife's family is there and stuff and I, I love them and like I had friends but I wasn't like the culture down there was pretty rough and I was like going through like dad passing away type yeah, situation heavy energetic shifting and shit so it was like I want to be around my family like I'm a only child so you know there's nobody else for uh parents and whatever um so i talked to my like them partner now wife um congrats <laughs> and was like uh you want to move to maine and we came up and like after she visited once she was like all right easy you know like nice and you've and you've been here since i yeah so been here since like I was I was looking at my own resume and I was like, <laughs> all right, like 2011, I moved back. Nice. Yeah. But you've always been from here, so it's not like you really ever left too too much in a sense. No. Even when you move away, you know, when you come back to Maine, you can. I feel like that's that's kind of how Maine works, though. It's like people move away and then they drag someone back with them. I could see that. Yeah. You know, like it's it's just kind of what happens. It is very uh. I don't know. It's a really welcoming place for a lot of people who haven't been here before. If they like kind of like a slower, you know, pace of life in a sense, depending where you live, you feel feel like nature. I think you can just fall in love with Maine so easily. Well, and I think everybody has like, you know, what they're making money doing. And then also a side hustle or something that they just enjoy doing. Oh, like this? Like this, right? <laughs> I mean, I know you make millions of dollars off this. Yeah, one day. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like, it's like everybody is doing things that they enjoy. Or it, it feels like that to me. Like, most of the people in my life, they have, like, you know, uh, my dad used to say, um, you know, something to feed the body and then something to feed the soul. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for you sure. Know? It's like... Uh... You know, passion, vocation, job. It's all different, you know, parts of a greater whole that we have to kind of balance, I think, to feel at peace in a sense, man. Yeah. <laughs> How important are bees to you? Bees. I I like bees. I, Do I you have, have bees? I have bees. Do you I, have honey? I have two hives. Where'd I'd, you get the beehives, man? Uh, a couple of years back, I think I'm. Um, Did you get like really b- bought deep. into like the uh, save the bees movement or? No, like um, my uncle is like he's a master beekeeper, and when I moved back, he's been basically trying to get me to have bees since I moved back, because that's what he loves. For like almost <laughs> ten years, he's trying to get the bees. Yeah. And it worked. Yeah. And so um, I did a shift in my life and started like, I I stay at home with my kids now and it's like I needed something else, another another hobby to tack on to the life. And so uh, I, I was like, okay, I'm ready to get bees. So like I'm on my second or no, this will be my third. Se- we're going into the third season. But, like, first season, they didn't survive the winter. This season, they did. R.I.P. Bees. Yeah. I mean, Wait, but... What do you mean? The, fir- the first ones died. Oh, oh, and then you get new ones. He, he, your uncle, the plug, he got all the bees. He's got the bees. I mean, I still got to pay the uncle for... That's like, true. Because you got to pay for queens. I'm like... Oh, that's... Start yeah, cause off You put hives. the queen in the hive and all the bees yeah. go to the queen, right? Yeah. Um, That's just fucking weird. No, I mean, it's it's a whole it's a whole gang of ladies in that hive. It makes sense, but nature be weird. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you put one off. It must send off like pheromones or something, right? There, but you know why I I believe in the the invisible world more than the visible world? Shit like pheromones. Like you can't see pheromones. You can't see gravity. You can't see emotions. You can't see sound for the most part. All this shit. You can't see germs. All the shit you can't see is the biggest effect on us, I feel like. Yeah, I mean, but I technically you could see them if you could, like... Yeah, 
hypothetically by universal law you could, <laughs> but with my mammal dumb little pooples, I can't see that shit, bro. Yeah. But the bee, the bee doesn't really see, but, but the bee knows. The bee knows yeah. it's got to go to the queen. Yeah. There's a metaphor in there. It's about intuition or something. <laughs> I just wanted yeah. to keep asking you a no. bunch of weird questions. Yeah. All right. Let's go. Did you and Mozart 212 ever link when you both worked at Wayne Fleet? No. Uh, we didn't work at Wayne Fleet at the same time. Oh. Yeah. But you both had worked there at the same, or both well, had worked at the same school. Yes. And, segue. Mozart two one two and you mm-hmm. are human fam. That is correct. When did you link with Mozart two one two for the first time, and then kind of segue that into how human fam came about? Uh, we we did a. I was playing at the Jewel Box once a month, pretty much. Was this? To pause you, because I know when I interviewed Mo, he said he kind of came to Maine like after nine eleven. But it sounds like, because he's from New York, you were, were you touring the country when he first moved here? No, 9-11, I was working at Wayne Fleet. You remember the day? I remember. I have. Did uh, they wheel I, the TVs out? I have videotape. I I worked nights. I was like a janitor. Uh, you know, I, I, I did night maintenance at Wayne Fleet. So I was like sleeping, woke up, turned on the TV. I've got like VHS tape of that. That's wild. Because what? Then Mo was in New York when that happened, and then Mo obviously yeah. moved up here afterwards. Were you then DJing at Jewelbox like years later? Like how? Yeah, years later. This would have been like because I would have left for like six years or so and come back. Because then you went to what the Bay, DC, came. Yeah, back. and then um, I forget how we actually like how I met. Did he still have Maryland. a restaurant at that point when you met when you first met him? A what? He had like a sandwich place or a restaurant. Did he? Yeah, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure Mo had a. Go, I didn't know. Go, I, go back and listen to the Mo two one two. Yeah, I'll have to. Yeah. No, like I I don't recall that. I forget how. I think it was like a sandwich place, like a lunch place. Maybe I could be wrong. I think. Like we were kind of in the. I think when he got here, I was just leaving, and then. When, like, I came back, we were kind of in some of the same circles. But we did, like, um, some stuff at the Jewel Box. I think the first time we played together for that, there could have been things that, like, were bigger things that we played or, like, di- did different things Just together. Just like a, a larger bill. Yeah. Um, but it, it was uh, Snow Dogs because I used to take all these like movie posters and just stick my head the on Cuba those good and junior one yeah. yeah so it's like a poster with like my face and mo's face over a couple of the dogs and like Cuba good and junior in the middle and you know <laughs> <laughs> you know <it's... laughs> and after that i just it was a kismet friendship yeah and i mean then i think we did like like a Revenge of the Nerds one and like stuff like that. And then I hit him up one day because I was, I had this idea for human fam and I was like, what is human fam? It's just like us together. I, my initial thing was like to be more people, but like once I talked to him, he was like, no, this should be us. Like, this is what we're going to do. And so it's, it's kind of like, I mean, I think that with, like, DJing, you know, a lot of times it's, like, a a solo act type of situation. But, like, it can be really helpful to have people that have your back, like, when you're DJing. and like multiple DJ bills, man. And, like, switching off. And, like, you got, like, a four-hour set, and you can, like switch off every 15 minutes or half hour and switch it up. Even little things like a... Oh shit! I gotta really take a piss, but I can't because there's one minute left in the song. Yeah, or <laughs> or like sometimes you show up to a set and you're just like, I'm just not feeling this. Like like, I'm because personally I have to be in the zone to do like, I I'm one of those people that like prepares for sets and I like, I might not even play like most of the set list I put together, but I have to like, uh, 
kind of organize it in my head ahead of time and then go from there. And sometimes, you know, like just just like with anything, you know, sometimes you're just not feeling it that day. So you need someone else to like set it off Oh yeah. or like, you know, you don't feel well or something. You got to have it's good to have backup. You know, we all got to take Definitely. care of ourselves, you know, so. Especially someone, I mean, you can trust like in their energy as well as their musical taste. It just kind of creates like a, I don't know, a cool bond that adds to the already like togetherness that music can really make, make you feel in a sense with other people. But like, it's one thing when you're DJing and people are feeling your music, but like if you're DJing with a homie, and you're both kind of just vibing, and then everyone's vibing. That's a very cool feeling. I also think it's good to have that, like, sense of, like, oh, they're, like, killing this part of the mix, or, like, they're, like, cutting, like, at this part, and it's, like, it sounds so good, and then you're, like, what am I going to do next? To, like, step it up and, like, push yourself to do better. You know, like, sometimes you need... Like, even sometimes we'll, like, fuck with each other, like, the last song you put on. Like, there have been times where it's like, oh, I'm going to drop this song real quick before I, like, Mm -hmm. leave it. And next person's like, fuck. Sorry. I don't know if I'm... Oh, you can, yeah. I'm just fucking swearing this shit, yeah. Okay. Like, and it's like... I am my own sponsor. Actually, no. Yardy Ting sponsors this podcast. Shout out Yardy Ting. That's it. We got no fucking agendas. It's just us. Yeah. So it's just like sometimes, you know, it, it pushes you to like take it somewhere where you weren't thinking about going and then like, you know, being on the fly about that and like getting out of your own head. Yeah. Shout out Mozart 212. Shout out yeah. Human Fam. Look for more sets in the future. Let's kind of wind down here, I guess. You also produce yeah. I a little bit here and there. A little bit here and there. And you shoot photography. Yes. Yeah. I saw those two. I wanted to shout that out. It seems like DJing was like your main passion, but those are also parts of your artistic yeah. quilt. I I started shooting photography because I got a job at a camera store in San Francisco. No oh, shit. And then I was just like, oh, I'm, I have access to this stuff. I should probably like know how to do it. <laughs> that's, that's true, though. <laughs> you know, it's like a uh, necessity type of thing. Mm. Yeah. And production, I, like, try and make stuff occasionally, but I don't always have, like, the the laser focus to sit there yeah, for yeah. hours. I hey, have, yo, yeah. quick, get that cat out of there. The cat's, cat's trying to get out. I hear the cat fucking around in the background. <laughs> <laughs> what are you producing? Do you, do you mostly use, like, gear, or, like, is it more software-focused? Um, I mean, it used to be, like, a, I used, like, a sampler sequencer, um, Yamaha SU700, um, which is like pretty old now. And like some instruments, I had like a, a bell set I used on a bunch of tracks and like uh, Omni Chord, which is like kind of like a Casio keyboard yeah. type of situation, it but like... it plays full chords and like it can oh, sustain shit. notes. So I did like a little more like, um, I don't know weird electronic music yeah and then like a machine i use machine sometimes to produce with or whatever you know it's dope yeah are you ready to do some rapid fire questions oh fuck i'm not a fast person so we'll figure it out all right dj that inspires you uh oh man that's like <laughs> that's so just, just, just one. It's gotta I, be one. It's so many names are like going through my head. I'm I'm gonna go with uh local. I'm gonna go with uh DJ Mayonnaise. DJ Mayonnaise from Anticon. Yeah. His uh his first mixtape was like pretty incredible and like definitely opened my eyes some stuff and also there was a house party where he like came through and I was playing I didn't really know him and he like just picked out records and like was matching beats like and I was in like high school and hey, picking like ran- just picking random records from my records 
Did he was he, like, could I can... play a couple records? And he just like picked out records and like matched them. And I was just like. What? Was he messing with the tempo at all? Or was it just like. Oh, yeah. No, he was It just like I, I was like. It was like second nature. And so at that time, it was just my brain was just like, oh, like that's possible. And it's like happening right here. You yeah. know? Do you think he had known what was on the records beforehand or was it just blind, like rhythm roulette shit? I don't know. Because if I could be like, maybe if you know the record and you'd be like, all right, I know which matches up. But if you, if you were just going in blind and you matching shit, that's that's very difficult to I do. I mean, it was it was like a lot of hip hop and a lot of like jungle in that like crate so it was i'm sure like there were things that were known but also like it was just to like hop on someone time. else's like gear and like start matching stuff up like with records that you're just pulling is like a skill into itself yeah you that's, know? that's wild shit portland food spot you want to shout out oh damn um Oof. I'll say Woodford's food and beverage. Yeah. Favorite DJ controller. Controller? Yeah. Uh I'd say Rev Seven. That's that's my like main go to right now. I have like a a reloop ready that I use for like kinda travel type stuff, but like the Rev Seven like motorized decks, you kind of can't go wrong. Are those ones that just automatically just spin it? Yeah. So can it you, it just feels more like turntables. Can are those like a? I don't even know what the terminology would be. Is it like an actual turntable you put the record on, or is it one of the ones you can actually just no? Scratch it's on? it's just got like uh, jog wheels on it. And that's it, that's what mine shows, has, right? Yeah, and it shows the waveform and stuff actually on the jog wheel. I gotta like at, just be like, Yo, Gabe, what's this called? I have like my own little fucking things in my brain for it. You should come yeah. over to the studio sometime. Yeah, I got a I, yeah. terminology is like one of my biggest. Uh, I think for most people too, it's one of my biggest. Like, uh, I don't even know what the word is, man. I mean, I think barriers. You, you were just displaying it, right? Yeah. Terminology is one of your biggest. It's a <laughs> example by. <laughs> I can't even do it right now. Now, <laughs> dude, now my brain's starting to really freak out because I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing it within itself. <laughs> At the end of the day, words are really hard, and although I can communicate in my head and maybe find shared meaning, I don't actually know what fucking terminology to use to correlate it half the yeah. time. So, I, chef, I think it's fine to just say whatever, and if people want to get all like nitpicky about stuff, who cares? That's true. Right? I, like, I think it's more like respect too, and like I just want to learn. I just want to make sure yeah. I know like. What people have to learn before me, in a sense. Yeah. But at the same time, I like that. Talk shit, fuck them. Keep going. <laughs> What's a goal you still have? I mean, I'm trying to play out of state more. Like, I've been on a couple, like, tours through parts of the U.S., like Canada, but, like, um, just playing out of state, which I have a couple gigs booked but I, i'm trying to play out of state like way more you know what's an album you'll never get tired of i don't know i i rotate through so much music like that it's that's really difficult oh man i don't know i I don't know if I have any like full albums like that. I'm I'm like no that gold, with. no random Goldie album. <laughs> no, I just don't like. I don't have any like. Full Gabe albums. FM says fuck albums. That's the yeah, quote. I'm I mean, kidding. yeah. I, if nothing I comes to mind, nothing yeah, comes to mind. An well, honest answer is the best answer. Who's an artist you still want to see live? You know, I I don't like seeing artists live anymore. I've met too many of them, and so many are like dicks that I'm just like I don't want to meet people because once I meet someone and I find out they're a terrible person, then I never want to like listen to their music. Even like again. a random concert, like Sade is one of my favorite singers ever. I, I'm dying to see a Sade. Sade no. literally look me in the face and spit in my face, and I'd still watch the whole show with a no, smile on my face. No, because I mean, even like I was 
pretty excited to see diggable planets. And that was such a letdown for me. What do you mean? They just weren't on. I thought the were... fucking audio people messed up that show more than Diggable did. I, yeah. The but, microphone kept squeaking during that show. But also show. they were like trying to do like some, their like new solo st- like styles. Oh, instead of maybe like and, back and forth. And I felt like they could have like, I would have been much happier if they just played like the tracks with like. You know, even if they didn't have a DJ and they had someone oh, like, hitting a CD player, like playing like instrumentals, like I would have been much happier with that. Because it was it was the uh, 30th anniversary of Reaching, I think is what they were touring for. Yeah, uh, and Reaching that Reaching is probably cl- close to one the, of those albums. Is that the album you never get tired of? <laughs> I mean, I did listen to it a lot. I used to have it on tape, and I'd throw like a boombox in my backpack and listen to that as I like walked around. I do love that album. Yeah. Well, hey, be like that. Yeah. What's the weirdest place you've DJed a set? Um. Strangest. Strangest. It's like, how the fuck did I get here? Uh, Maybe you don't have one. I don't know. I mean, so, um, I used to, I DJed for a couple rappers, like, after I moved back to Maine, and one of them was J.D. Walker. Uh, and we did a small tour. And we were in, like, Raleigh, North Carolina. And we got to the show venue. And the promoter had to call the show venue to open up because they didn't know they had a show that day. That's pretty funny. <laughs> and, like, five people showed up. It was, like, a very odd situation. And then we end up sleeping in, like, kids' bunk beds. And uh, Bluebird was there, and he was sleeping in, like, a princess little girl's room. And like so, yeah, someone's house or something? Yeah, like we were staying at someone's house. house something? Like, And Jay was on the top bunk, and it was, like, creeping down. Like, But, like, that was, that was kind of a weird set just because we walked in, and it was just, like, you didn't know you had a show. All that right. so weird. Yeah, and it was like a venue, like, not like a bar, you know, like, wasn't like a spot where, like, there would be a few people drinking at the bar. It was like straight up venue. Huh. Yeah. That is weird. Last one. Would you rather have to stay on a plane in the air for six months or be on a boat on the water for two years? In a plane for six months? Or on a boat for two, boat for two years. That's pretty easy. One. I don't want to be in a plane for six months. That would freak me out. I mean, I I'd probably get real seasick. But <laughs> I mean, I I could pull through. Tremendous. Well, Gabe yeah. FM, we pretty much reached the end here now. A um, couple more quick questions. All right. Is there anything you want to plug? <sighs> Shout out shows. Oh, man, I have a a bunch of. DJ gigs coming up in June, but I mean, where, where can people like find all these? Uh, if they go to the Human Fam Instagram, which is like Human underscore Fam, I believe. I can double check that. But what's your what's your social media? Do you know yours? <laughs> I think is it's Gabe underscore. I think there's underscores and everything. But I'm a I'm a look because hey, I never well, think about well, it. Well, right? he looks. Like, I'll uh, do some final shout-outs before we get to these last questions. Shout-out Yardy Ting for sponsoring this podcast. Shout-out Soto on the instrumental. Shout-out Willow Picks. Shout-out Tristan on the introduction. Shout-out everybody out there listening and watching. Um, did you figure out what it was? Yeah, it's Gabe underscore FM. Perf- also, like, there's humanfam.com, all one word, human and everything fam. can be found through that? Dot com that has, like, a calendar. Um so there's links to that website on gabefm.com all that perfect stuff. what's one thing you want to shout out about portland i don't know people people need to go hang out at the parks what's up what's up with people not and hanging out at like deering oaks and I like to ask you too chilling transportation you're involved in transportation right yeah i'm, I'm we there. need better public transportation in town too well i I'm the chair of the Transit Advisory Board for South Portland. You got a 
could put some foot on Portland's necks. Well, no, like that's you. The, you hold all the power. No, I don't. <laughs> um, it's an advisory committee, and I'm dealing with actually a lot of stuff where Metro's trying to come in and snake uh, our transportation department. So it's um, beef. I mean, it's not beef, but it's just like we used to be part of Metro, and now we're not because we weren't being served properly and now like there was some major issues that arose and now metro's putting forth proposals to take over south portland transit but it's a not it's not totally welcome because we'll probably end up losing um you know service and so that's not cool all you leaders, quit fucking with people's transportation. That's all I'm going to say. Bureaucrats, oligarchs, greedy motherfuckers, let people have the right to live in places and let people have the right to get clean food and let people have the right to just transport the way they got to transport. I hate post-Henry Ford America. Fuck Henry Ford. Gabe FM. <laughs> also, I'm just going to say transportation shouldn't be about getting... From where you live to a job, transportation should be about getting to public spaces that exactly. don't have anything to do with commerce. Exactly. Just going to throw that out there. I <laughs> agree with that. More power to the people. What's one tip of advice you give to DJs who are starting off? Um, don't, don't like second guess yourself, you know, like. Just do things, but also remember, charge people money. Please charge people money. Like, I mean, I think of it like, you know, a plumber or something. You know, <laughs> people should get paid to do things. Like, that's, you know, you're, you're providing a service. Don't do it for like drink tickets and like 20 bucks. Like you, you bought that gear, you put time in, you know, it, it's time to book places. Make sure you're like charging people like a reasonable amount of money for your time. You know, I know everybody's excited to DJ out, but like you gotta, you gotta like know your worth too. I think, and like respect your worth. So, yeah. I agree. Gabe FM, it's been a fun conversation. We've spoken for almost an hour and 20 minutes. Damn, sorry, sorry about that long one. <laughs> one final question. Yeah. Where will Gabe FM be one year from now? I don't know. I, I'm not, I'm not like, uh, you could barely remember dates. Yeah, recent I'm, dates. I'm bad at dates. I mean, I'm I'm hoping that I'll, you know, be doing more like DJing and you know, have some other things in the works. You know, dissertation about sound waves and bees. <laughs> could just be throwing all types of BPMs and genres and sounds at them from the booth. It's it's just gonna be buzzing, like mixed together. It's real like heavy industrial reverb. garage, just like it almost sounds like bees. Yeah. All right. Uh, as I said, shout out Yardy Ting for sponsoring this podcast. Infinite love. Shout out everybody who listens. Rhymebeat.com. Fuck white supremacy. Fuck the system, and we'll see you next time. Peace.